We sing a tale of bears who sought a gem, a pirate's treasure lost for centuries. Three brown and one translucent bear left home to sail to where the ice wall meets the sea. An albatross bore messages of hope. A panda bear needs rescue from the seals. The penguins guard the treasure in the ice, a gemstone of the heavens without price. Lord, help us with our story to be told. The animals are ready to set out. Four brother bears, they stand before you bold. Their quest to find a gemstone in the south. Dread monsters they fear not, nor icy cold. They want to know what life is all about. Adventure calls, they board their ship and sail. And thus with rhymes, we now begin our tale. I'm very grateful to be able to speak with you today about the importance of storytelling and its role in nourishing our community and culture, particularly for our family and children. We've all felt the effects this past two years, hopefully no longer in counting, of not having access to our usual older, now lost communities. Two weeks to flatten the curve turned into month after month of uncertainty, not being able to engage with each other in person. Conferences were canceled, classes were thrown into Zoom rooms, church services were streamed into our smartphones and brought many of us here to St. John Cantius, thankfully. It has been easy to fall into despair. What use could literature, particularly poetry, be in such a time when what we want is a shield from the plague? Surely we would have been better off spending our time in lockdown learning how to fight viruses and boost our immune systems, writing poetry is better left at times when we can relax and contemplate, not when we are in the thick of battle against economic collapse, famine, political dysfunction, war, and disease, plague. Well, you see where I'm going already, I'm sure. <laughs> of all the lies that Satan uh, AKA our modern Western secular enlightened and scientific culture has told us, the most diabolical is surely that storytelling is a waste of time. Childish, something better left to those without real work to do. Frivolous compared with the serious business of fighting structural injustice and making money. I don't have time to read novels, the serious businessman, academic, lawyer, or scientist says. Anyone whose fiction has inspired an excess of cosplay and a high IQ version of the fangirling generally associated with K-pop boy bands cannot, pop, cannot be completely innocent, the serious computer programmer says about our favorite Christian Arthur J.R.R. Tolkien. Plus, of course, fangirls squeal. Fairy stories, aka the quintessential form of Christian literature, are escapist nonsense. The real world requires seeing the ugliness of things, not sugarcoating it with stories about fairies and dragons, says every inspiring, aspiring serious critic. Just ask Edmund Wilson, um, 1956 review of the Fellowship of the Ring, ooh, those awful orcs. Um, Germaine Greer, 1997, um, comment on the fact that Tolkien had been um, declared the author of the century, quote, it has been my nightmare that Tolkien would turn out to be the most influential writer of the 20th century, the bad dream has materialized. Or you could ask Guardian critic Richard Eyre, writing in 2004 about the movies coming out about Tolkien, about Middle Earth as the kingdom of kitsch. Well, we would not be here this morning if we did not believe that telling stories was important. And yet, who among us has not felt just a little bit silly fangirling our favorite Christian authors. That's how I, in fact, spent my COVID sabbatical, which was making videos about Tolkien, right? Fangirling constantly. Worse, <laughs> who here has written fan fiction and hidden it in a drawer? Thesis. <laughs> All Christian literature is fan fiction. That's why we find it embarrassing. Even Tolkien was embarrassed at publishing the Lord of the Rings. He wrote to his friend, Father Robert Murray um, of the Jesuits, in the same letter in, in December 1953, where he described the Lord of the Rings as, quote, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the vision. In that same letter where he admitted that, you know, well, at least was maybe making a, a, a hope that 
Father Mur um, Murray would like it, I don't know, but saying it's a fundamentally Catholic work, he then went on to say, quote, I am dreading the publication, for it will be impossible not to mind what is said. I have exposed my heart to be shot at. Tolkien admitted that his publishers were nervous too and wanted to get advanced copies to, quote, as many people as possible so that they could, quote, form an opinion before the hack critics get busy. But then, of course, the critics would hate it, as Edmund Wilson did, ooh, those awful orcs. It had nothing to do with the kind of literature they liked to read, and Tolkien knew it. As Ronald explained to Father Robert, the source of his story was the faith in which he was brought up by his mother and nourished from the age of eight, not the study of English literature. Quote, this is still Tolkien, for the simple reason that I have never found much there in which to rest my heart or heart and head together. Christian literature is a place in which we rest our hearts. Is that why there is so little of it? Please prove me wrong. <laughs> but even Lewis and Tolkien, embedded as they were in Oxford English faculty, felt the lack, and they were writing long before the current incarnation of our culture war. It is why they started writing their own stories. They couldn't find enough of the kind they wanted to read. As Tolkien told Charlotte and Dennis Plummer, who had interviewed him for the Daily Telegraph magazine, February 1967, quote, I'm always looking for something I can't find, something like what I wrote myself. There's nothing like being vain, is there? <laughs> Which he then qualified. Tolkien does this a lot, right? He'll say one thing and then you realize he's being British or English, English much more particularly, then qualified. An apology for seeming to speak out of vanity. Actually, this arose in humility, my own and Lewis's, the humility of amateurs in a world of great writers. Lewis said to me one day, Tollers, there is too little of what we really like in stories. I am afraid we shall have to try and write some ourselves. Now, famously, Lewis and Tolkien did what they called a toss-up. Um, Lewis would write a space travel story, while Tolkien would write a time travel story, which he purposed to model on the Atlantis legend. Um, Lewis famously managed not one, but three what they called science fiction stories. Um, Out of the Silent Planet, Pure Landra, and That Hideous Strength, um, Tolkien only managed, to dra only managed drafts of a few of, cha of chapters of two, The Lost Road and The Notion Club Papers, before finishing at long last the great time travel story of The Lord of the Rings. Now, it's possible to argue, of course, that all subsequent fantasy and science fiction has come under the sway of Tolkien and Lewis, Tolkien arguably even more than Lewis, and that much of the appeal of this literature is its dependence on Christian structures, characters, and themes. Think angels and demons plus Christ figures. And yet, as students in my course on Tolkien regularly argue, just because an author says he was writing as a Christian, as Tolkien tried to convince Father Murray, doesn't mean that his stories depend on Christianity for their appeal. That's my student's argument. It's like, I, I don't have to believe that Tolkien's writing is a Christian to like his story, do I? I don't like that. He, it's a, it's a, in, an interesting wrestling. Conversely, of course, just because a story has angels and demons plus Christ figures, think Harry Potter or Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Doctor Who, <laughs> does not make it Christian doctrinally or spiritually. So what are the criteria for the kinds of stories I want to read if what I want to read are Christian stories. So I take my cue from the great medieval Christian poet Dante Alighieri, um, more particularly his letter to Con Grande de la Scala, uh, written in 1318 or 1319, while he was working on the, the Commedia, right? Christian stories like Dante's Commedia are by definition polysemous working on several levels at once, just as scripture was seen to work on several different levels. Um, remember what I said about Christian literature as fan fiction. More specifically, Christian literature is fan fiction written in conversation with the Bible. 
Just as medieval Christian commentators found four levels of meaning in their reading of scripture, so, Dante argued, his own poem worked on four levels. And this, this, for Dante, this is what made the Commedia Christian, but also saying, I'm writing scripture. Well, what did he mean? The first level, there's, there's four levels. The first level is that conveyed by the letter, the history or story carried by the literal meaning of the text. The second level is the allegorical or mystical meaning, which itself has three levels. The allegory, quote, where what is meant is our redemption through Christ. The moral or moral sense, where what is meant is the conversion of the soul from the sorrow and misery of sin to a state of grace. And the anagogical, where what is meant is the passing of the sanctified soul from the slavery of our present corruption to the liberty of our everlasting glory. Okay, so there's the literal and the spiritual sense, and the spiritual sense is itself layered with allegory, morality, and anagogy. What would it mean to write new stories in this medieval mode? Well, first, um, there needs to be a story. <laughs> um, the story needs to work on its own terms not just as an allegory. And this, if you're familiar with Tolkien's resistance to saying, what does the Lord of the Rings mean? And he's always saying, it's not an allegory, right? This is the reason that Tolkien was so adamant that the Lord of the Rings is not an allegory. In his phrase, I much prefer history, true or feigned. He wanted his readers to find themselves enchanted, but not duped into looking for personifications or topical references. Fantasy, as he understood it, does not work if it is not grounded in the real. As Tolkien put it, quote, for creative fantasy is founded upon the hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun, on a recognition of fact, but not a slavery to it. If men really could not distinguish between frogs and men, fairy stories about frog kings would not have arisen. So the story needs to work actually as a story. There needs to be some engagement with it um, as, as something that you're enchanted by. Allegory. Now, we might rather say symbolism. The story will be satisfying insofar as it seems to point outside itself. Tolkien talked about applicability, which he said resides in the freedom of the reader, as opposed to allegory, which resides in the, quote, purpose domination of the author. <laughs> Um, a better term, however, than allegory, which often gets tangled up in other kinds of uh, personifications and so forth, a better term um, might be parabolic, uh, modeled on the stories or parables that Jesus told. And here it, it helps to have a little um, etymology, right? Um, par parable comes from the Greek parabole. Um, it's a translation of mashal um, from the Hebrew, and in Hebrew um, the word means something like a range of meanings, like proverb, riddle, anecdote, allegory, right? Mashalim were stories in which the kingship of God was shown in shadow or image. Thus, Jesus's parables are about the coming of the kingdom, right? There, so there's a parable, and I, I want you to keep this, all of this, it's, it's, it, we, we think of them mainly as moral stories, right? But they have this layering, they're anecdotal, and they have riddles, and they have symbolism, right? They're like proverbs with their hidden meanings um, because they have secrets, right? Parables contain secrets, moments at which the veil of the temple is pulled away to reveal the mysteries within. Um, in literary terms, this is a more formal definition from Sally McFaig, quote, a parable is an extended metaphor which allows for a flash of insight through a juxtaposition of the ordinary within a startling new context. Parables, in, the, in this understanding, are stories about the incarnation, God's kingship on earth as it is in heaven. Um, they work as a fusion of image and word, mythos and logos, imagination and reason, heaven and earth, both equally real. Right? And you realize this is, this is far more than saying you know, justice is, is um, represented as a woman in, in you know, the allegories of the virtues or something like that. That in a parable, in a riddle, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an actual allegory, you are catching glimpses of heaven through representations of earth. You are kept catching um, understanding of the logos through a mythos 
through a story, that you're fusing imagination and reason um, because all are equally real, right? There's not just the personification that then the veil is pulled away and it, it vanishes and all you understand is justice. You need um, both of those things to be true. Tolkien understood that therefore the, a parable, a fairy story, an allegory was made in the image and likeness of a maker. We tell stories because we are made in an image and likeness of God and the, the, the parable is itself a demonstration of this incarnation. Okay, so there's the, the, the history level and the allegory, and then there needs to be actually a lesson in um, virtue, right? Morality. The character should be put through a test that helps them train in virtue. Um, this is, of course, the arc of the story that Dante goes on, the journey that Dante goes on from hell to purgatory to heaven. Um, the Commedia is, a, is, if you read it, you know, he's the main character as the pilgrim, and he's being trained in understanding sin and penance and then given a glimpse of the contemplation of, of heaven. The whole point of the Commedia was for Dante to recognize his sinfulness and learn virtue through penance so that he can ascend to the vision of God. It's important, uh, I think, in, in thinking about this, right, to note that training in virtue, if, if we understand it this way, takes place in the world but is not of the world. And this, um, it, it, I think it helps you start dis disentangling um, simple, you know, uh, superhero stories from actual moralities. Training in virtue takes place in the world but is not of the world. It is not about conquering our enemies by being badass. Although being Christian is very badass in competition with the devil. I mean, St. Michael, right? Okay, fine. <laughs> it's rather about recognizing that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. This world is our place of trial and training. Well, for what? We don't know until we level up at death, right? So <laughs> we're, in the, we're in this life, we're in this world now be, to be training in virtue. Um, thus, in, in our Christian stories, there is no happily ever after, at least not in this life. Rather, and here, the, and here you realize I've been, I've been hanging out online a lot with like people talk about games and stuff, right? The ride never ends, as the gamer said in Gamergate. <laughs> Our skills and virtues give us greater strengths, powers of the soul, but there's always a sequel. So we're always in further conflict, not absolute victory. Um, in our stories, it's dramatically necessary, therefore, to put our characters in peril, um, but give them real tests, right? The test should be real and draw on real temptations to sin. Um, stories for children especially need to show that the dragons are real, but as Chesterton put it, that they can be fought. Um, I also think victory should come through a test of the soul, um, the choices that the characters make, not magic or technology. And Lewis and Tolkien were actually fairly um, consistent in this. That, you know, they, the, the, what, what matters in the, the the power of their tales is that the characters are given choices and they must make good choices, not that they have a better weapon, right? The ring is the great weapon, you don't want that one. Um, a major theme will necessarily be discernment of temptation, where's the, where the lies lie, as it were. Okay, so that's, you've got history, you've got allegory, morality, and um, the fourth layer in these stories um, will be anagogy. Um, the lifting up in contemplation. And it's often said something like anagogy points to last things, but it's, it's the paradisical vision um, that we are yearning for, right? This is hardest to achieve because it requires making contact with the divine, but it's actually, I argue, fairly easy to recognize if you're reading it in a Christian story. It's that moment when you cry, <laughs> when you tear up or weep for joy. It's more profound this anagogy, than the satisfaction of solving the riddle, the allegory, or experiencing the pleasure of understanding the symbolism, although in my experience it does depend on the correspondences set up in the allegory, right? So this anagogy, this, this is why there's a difference between allegory and anagogy because allegory is showing you this, the, the relationship between heaven and earth. Anagogy is giving you that sense of being lifted up. Um, so it's like allegory but with a, 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 a something else in, in its essence. Um, even more, and this is why I think it comes allegory plus the morality, it depends on the sense of virtue, right? The trials overcome that have ended in defeat. So you're not going to get the anagogy simply by being shown an allegory of Christ in the church. You need the moral test that will then lift you up into 
the, the um, experience. Above all, however, this anagogical layer needs to feel real, historical, not just symbolic or allegorical. The enchantment needs to break through into the primary reality find, and so that we ourselves, as the audience of the story, find ourselves inside it. And Tolkien famously coined a term for this experience, it's the eucatastrophe, right? That moment of joy, not a happy ending as such, not simply the happily ever after, but as he described it, the sudden joyous turn of the good catastrophe. And this is the way he describes it in his famous on fairy stories, where he's, he's been trying to get you to the point where you see fairy stories are Christian ultimately, um, but that they give you this experience of joy um, through their, through their um, eucatastrophe. Quote, this joy, which is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well, is not essentially escapist nor fugitive. In its fairy tale or other world setting, it is a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur. It does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, of sorrow and failure. The possibility of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat. And insofar is Evangelium, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the world, walls of the world, poignant as grief. In such stories, when the sudden turn comes, we get a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire that for a moment passes outside of the frame, rins indeed the very web of story and lets a gleam come through. Um, there are others who have also described this beautifully. Um, if you know Anthony Eastland's essays, um, he has a wonderful description in Ironies of Faith on the laughter at the heart of Christian literature. Um, you know, in the, in the, the promise that, that Christ made, behold, says he, I make all things new. Um, but I think for this audience, maybe Chesterton is, is the, the better one to compare with Tolkien. That, um, Chesterton talks about the great paradox of Christianity is that it turns us the right way up when we have been upside down. And this is from his orthodoxy. Quote, Christianity satisfies suddenly and perfectly man's ancestral instinct for being the right way up satisfies it supremely in this, that by its creed, joy becomes something gigantic and sadness something special and small. The vault above us is not deaf because the universe is an idiot. The silence is not the heartless silence of an endless and aimless world. Rather, the silence around us is a small and pitiful stillness, like the prompt stillness in a sick room. Sick room. We are perhaps permitted tragedy as a sort of merciful comedy, because the frantic energy of divine things would knock us down like a drunken farce. We can take our own tears more lightly than we can take the tremendous levities of the angels. So we sit perhaps in a starry chamber of silence while the laughter of the heavens is too loud for us to hear. Now, I know you're curious about these pictures that I've been showing you and the story that they are illustrating. And this is, this, there's, there's, there's multiple, mo there are moments of eucatastrophe in the, in the story itself, which I'm going to share with you. But the moment of writing this scene <laughs> was when it came to me. And I'm sitting there in my mother's dining room, which, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I had, we had some, we had a death in our family this past year. So I spent a lot of time with my mom and I'm working with my poets in our online Dragon Common Room, writing it, and we were write, trying to write the scene where, yes, the panda is, is grabbed by the griffin. I'm sure you want to know what that is. And we realize that we've just described the rapture, right? That the, the panda is there on the altar, which you just saw, um, and he's gobbling up the, uh, the goodies. And the griffin comes down through that oculus, down through that eye, raptures him, and takes him away. And then we're trying to figure out what this all means, and I'm looking up, and it's like, and I look up, and realize that what Tolkien said about the, the story, it's when it breaks, that eucatastrophe, when it breaks through, rends the web of story, and you find yourself in it yourself, when you find that the gospel is true and real and your life, that you're living that fairy story, and we figured out then, you know, that what they're questing for, this gemstone, this glowing gemstone down in the south, you're going to figure that out, is real and alive and light. And then I looked up, 
and realized I'd been sitting underneath the chandelier the whole time with these, see, it makes you weep too, right? This wonderful moment that we're in this story, right? I looked up and saw the lamps in my mother's dining room shining like the crystal eggs of the griffin. We had achieved the quest, the poem became real. How did we get there, <laughs> right? And this is writing Aurora Borealis, A Quest for Bears. And I want to say that we, we set out to try to do something Dantean. <laughs> and, and obviously with my own scholarly interest in, in teaching Tolkien and writing stories, I constantly have my students in my campus Tolkien class write their own stories. I figured I had to like finally do it myself and you know, see, whether, see whether I'd answer the, the, the call to adventure. But the, we, we spent um, 2021 basically working on the poem and, and writing together this group. And it, it, I mean, it's the closest I've come to understanding what it was to be an inkling, right, with Tolkien and Lewis and their community of writing together. But I think also, hopefully, starting to make a translation from what I know from my scholarly study of this tradition into we want stories like this, right? We want stories in our modern culture that are doing what Dante was trying to do, but that answer the kinds of things that, that we're also struggling with in the present. So how did we do this? Well, OK, at the historical level. <laughs> um, in um, Father David's introduction, he read some of our website um, description of the Dragon Common Room. This is it, right? That's what it looks like online, although the, the building in the background is mine. That's the anchor stein that I, I've been practicing making little churches and things with. But it's a chat room in a social media platform, and we can work together because of the structure of the platform. So. We, we have this community, of, um, community of, of writers that have come together by way of a number of other online communities. I mean, this is what's interesting about the, the COVID lockdown, right? One, we got to watch live streams from here every Sunday. Um, but it also meant that people were looking for other kinds of activities while we were not in our regular, our regular lives. And um, some of these people came together because of Milo's chat, right? I think some of you all know I know Milo. Um, others of them came together in other groups. Um, the Bears are another subset of, of, of these online communities. And we, as uh, the poets, we'd written another poem for, for adults called Centrism Games, which is a satire and not for children. Um, we wanted to write something for children, and um, we wanted to, um, I mean, that we got Hand Drawn Bear as our artist was a blessing, right? Because it was also wonderful to have an illustrator. Uh, we met regularly at tea time, an hour each weekday for seven months. Um, it was rather like a prayer schedule, and I you know, take my, my Benedictine um, study seriously. We start on time, we stop on time, and we um, did this on, a, on such a regular basis that I think it really did get us through the, the COVID stuff, the lockdown and, and things. Um, anecdotally, it was very good as a shield against losing ourselves in the fear. We could meet every day and find joy in the story that we were crafting. Um, the discipline of meeting regularly gave us a respite each day from the relentless effort and the culture at large to drive us to despair. And you all know, just because COVID's not the main headline anymore, they're still gonna try, right? Because the modern culture is a despair machine. Um, I also had to train them. <laughs> Um, I do not know iambic pentameter, at least I didn't two years ago, I do now, I can usually recognize it. Um, I actually started the Dragon Common Room simply as a place to practice writing iambic pentameter for my own purposes in learning to um, do a translation that I may still actually get to do of a medieval Latin text. But realizing that working in iambic pentameter is learning English in a very deep and profound way. It's the meter that Chaucer wrote in, it's the meter that Shakespeare uses in his soliloquies, it's the meter Milton wrote in, and it is in, in sort of palimpsest itself um, structured on Latin, which is interesting. You can, you can write iambic pentameter better if you say the office in Latin. There's, there's a reason for doing Latin there because it's, it's the, the sort of rhythm of the breath and the rhythm of our heart and the rhythm of a step, right? It's not totally natural to English because we like to sort of skip along in our prepositional phrases. We had to train in this, right? So there's a discipline of time that we had to meet regularly and there was a discipline of, of language. Logos through mythos, right? We needed to learn to write an iambic pentameter to tell a story. It was not enough just to have the story. We needed to discipline ourselves into the, um, uh, the, 
the tension, right, between logos and mythos, between reason and imagination. Um, one of my guides in this, and I actually showed you the yes, that yes comment on, one of my poets made that on a page that I showed them, um, was from Malcolm Geet's um, Faith, Hope, and Poetry, Theology and the Poetic Imagination. Geet describes very nicely the reason that we as Christians actually need poetry, um, not just, I mean, iambic pentameter, but poetry, um, because the medium of poetry is fundamentally incarnational, right? And this is Geet. Since the medium of poetry is language, a system of symbols, this involves asking questions about the relations between language, symbol, and truth, questions that poetry is peculiarly fitted to answer. These questions are particularly pertinent to the study of Christian theology, since that theology depends both on written scriptures and also on the radical idea that the word behind all words in scriptures has been made, not mere, more words, but flesh. Poetry may be especially fitted as a medium for helping us apprehend something of the mystery embodied in that phrase, the word was made flesh. So the regular meetings and actually learning to scan was, was very um, important. Then, I mean, this, this, this gets more to the kind of work I do in my teaching. It's like I teach history of Christianity, I teach biblical exegesis as a you know, literary and, and historical problem. But actually working on an allegorical level to use the kind of medieval symbolism that I know from my studies in a way that made it part of the story, right? Um, we had a guiding theme in the book. It's how to explain the doctrine of the Trinity to a child. <laughs> <laughs> and it works, right? By the end of the story, you will know how to, oh, hopefully, to, to show a, in a mythological understanding, we hope, what the, incarnate, uh, what the Trinity actually is. Um, the story needed to work as an adventure with real characters, not just personifications, because we also wanted to demonstrate the meaning of the incarnation, that the light that entered into the world and became incarnate, visible, and tangible is our faith, right? Well, how would we show this mystery? Through imagination, um, uh, meter imagination, and metaphor. Um, the poem needed to establish a correspondence between creation and revelation, nature and scripture, um, because of course the Trinity is not something that you can prove materially, only something that you can grasp through understanding as revealed through the incarnation, the word made flesh. We figured out how to do it, hopefully, right? <laughs> that, uh, that we are, uh, the aurora borealis is, is modeled on the aurora australis and the aurora, it's, um, sorry, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis, the north pole and the south pole lights, right? And we have this, the light, which is a real physical phenomenon, right? It's electromagnetic, which makes it even cooler. Um, the griffin, who you learn in the course of the story, is in fact the light right? Incarnate, the animals, the other animals can see him and talk to him. Um, and, but, and, but not everybody can see him, right? The, there is one character, the bad girl, um, who can't see him, but uh, the, the griffin incarnate, right? And then with the, the, the um, manifestation of his joy into the world is they all end up with Easter eggs. I just gave it away, right? But that, <laughs> that's why I was so, it was so fun for me when I was sitting under that glowing lamp, right? And I was like, here's the griffin's eggs, right? Okay, so we have, and, and there they are in the nest, right? The, 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 this, is, this is the moment at which the, all the animals have the contemplation. And you see the, the, the panda's already there, right? Because he's gotten there through the mass. <laughs> the others had to do it like through solving riddles and such, but the, the, the panda is, is just hungry, so hungry for the light that he's raptured, which you saw already. Okay, so we have, so we had the historical practice and then you know, this problem of we wanted to show theology in a, in a children's story. Um, but there's also a moral problem that uh, children's books really need to address and that we were, specifically in the fantasy genre, very, very concerned with making sure we countered, right? Um, and this, this is where this gets a bit dark, okay? There is a problem with children's literature generally um, it is a form of grooming. It's making children comfortable with Satanism, with lies and sin, particularly but not only sexual sins. Now, the, this poem is 
the kids are all out of the room now. <laughs> this poem is definitely, it, it, I promise you, it's, it's good for up to 12. We've tested it on 11 and 12 year olds and they like it. And they say, you know, it's not a baby book, so that's good. But it, I mean, we needed to find something that would show what happens when you're lured away into, into temptation, into, into sin, um, and do it in a way that would be okay for the kids, not too scary, but scary enough. Right, because you do need to show the real danger. And so we realized our poem needed to offer training against narcissists and gaslighting. We've all been we've all been gaslit as adults for the last several years. Help us teach our children how to recognize this stuff. The story should give readers the ability to recognize the techniques that narcissists use to gain control of their victims. Um, and also give readers an example of how to overcome the gaslighting how to fight the bullies, right? Like, and you know, I, as I see it, I mentioned, I, I gotta get my fencing practice back after not being able to do it for two years. But it is like training in fencing, but with emotions and reason, right? And our, our um, tension is with the seals and the way they lure the panda away and how the, the bears are able to um, help the panda. But the, the panda, it, it, there's, a, there's some like personal layers in this that are quite lovely that, um, uh, the panda is our main character as a mystic, right? And the, the, the other characters find him and rescue him and take him away. And you saw him, he's the one that the griffin you know, like takes directly to his nest. Um, our artist is Canadian um, and uh, she's Christian, she's, she's Baptist, but she's also Chinese, right? So she's Chinese, Christian, Canadian. She says, who is that, right? <laughs> Hand drawn bear, right? That um, you know, we're we're also trying to show there's there's a lot of cultural layers and personal layers and in, in this need to figure out ways of getting out of the dark story that we're in. And the panda is our is our kung fu panda um, analog. Okay, okay. So there's there's a more there's a strong moral in the in the story. Um, oh, here they are. The pan the first they just rescue rescue him, but by the end you realize the panda has. Um, he's not no longer just being rescued, he understands, right? And, and he's the one that shows the real joy of, of the griffin. Um, but then there's, of course, the anagogical level. Were we able to achieve that flash of insight linking heaven and earth? Well, as storytellers, we do have a, a great um, device for doing this. It's called reincorporation. <laughs> Um, in storytelling terms, it's also sometimes known as Chekhov's gun. Um, the sense of significance that you get from having uh, an object that you saw at the beginning reincorporated, right? That riddle, you know, riddles are doing that because you're having to reincorporate your knowledge. But having something in the story that um, you suddenly realize the full significance of um, at the end, right? Tolkien uses this magnificently, right? I think it's it, in fact what um, drives the, the great joy of his stories, and it's what drove him in all of the you know, chronologies and backstories and retellings and stuff like that. He was always in what I consider this Augustinian exercise of finding ourselves in the gospel, finding ourselves in the story. And the most famous of those um, is, for example, there are two, two moments, right? One, when Frodo and Sam are on the stairs of Kirith Ungol, um, and Sam looks up and he sees Arendel's star and realizes we're in that story, right? We are, why sir, I never thought of that before. We've got, you've got some of the light of it in that star glass that the lady gave you. Why to think of it, we're in the same tale still. The great moment of it comes on the field of Carmala and, and um, I've, I've since read a, a lovely essay by Michael Ward who's written beautifully on, on the, the Narnia stories about the Carmala is, is actually the true ring um, of, of the story. It's a ring of trees, it's a ring of gold trees. And in the midst of the ring of gold trees, lo, lords and knights and men of valor, unashamed, kings and princes, and fair people of Gondor, and riders of Rohan, and ye sons of Elrond, and Dunedain of the north, and elf and dwarf, and great hearted of the Shire, and all free folk of the west, now listen to my lay. This is the moment when the minstrel sings the story that you have been journeying through. And see, remember, Sam had wanted to hear this story. I want to hear our story. Well, now we're in that story. For I will sing to you a Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. And all the host laughed and wept 
and in the midst of their merriment and tears, the clear voice of the minstrel rose like silver and gold, and all men were hushed, and he sang to them, now in the elven tongue, now in the speech of the West, until their hearts wounded with sweet words overflowed, and their joy was like swords, and they passed in thought out to regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of blessedness. This is the fundamental eucatastrophe, this, this anagogy, the, the Christian experience of finding ourselves through conversion in the narr narrative of salvation. It's what Augustine talks about in his De Catechandis Rudibus. There is, we hope, certainly works for me, <laughs> a moment in our story in which you realize you, what story you've been in all along. And um, there's a clue in both of these pictures. You see the bears. You see the penguins on the top of the ice wall. You see the albatross. What else do you see? There's a fin. Yeah. Oh, that's a fish. You know, the fish are being caught up because this, this is, um, Ulfilas is being caught by the brothers in the fishing net, right? So they're fishers, mm -hmm. right? Um, this, the, that, right? Now we see, we see that fin. It's kind of menacing. When we get to the, the penguins and their city, they have an image that they sing songs to and pray to and hope that they will get help from, a procession, a very nice procession. But you don't really know who that is until the end when the seals have come back, the bears are, uh, they, the, the, they, they swamp the boat, they knock the boat over, and as the, the, they're all worrying about um, being in the water, the panda's been carrying those eggs, right? And he suddenly looks across the water and sees the orca. Now, it, okay, you can't do this right. Um, that we, what you realize when he's been groomed away, he's been taken away from his family and his mother, right? And when he looks across, he's got the eggs that the griffin gave him, and he sees the orca and he says, I see my mom. And then you realize who she is. <laughs> She's the Ark. She's the Orca. She's Our Lady. There's other layers, <laughs> right? We also have um, the riddles as in, in the, that the um, bears have to figure out as they're ascending the mountain inside. Um, the riddles are very, very important for um, we hope showing the magic of the liturgy, right? The sacraments. Um, unlocking the mystery never fully resolved and left for the characters to mull over. And that this is, um, as Adam Roberts says in his Riddle of the Hobbit, our appetite for story is a desire for closure. Religious mysteries are, in a sense, riddles, um, present, you know, presenting problems that can't be fully solved. And this is our riddles as, um, there's three of them, right? And they're, they're meant to be um, baptism, the Eucharist, and then um, conversion, right? The, the, I think, okay, well, this one, it's like riddles involve making familiar objects beautifully strange, awaking wonder and enchantment. Um, it's the process of engaging them rather than determining any one answer that is where their capacity for illumination is located, Robert Still. And this is just to give you a taste of, of our actual poetry. This is one of the, the three great riddles, um, Act Four, Stanza Eight. As they climbed the staircase and ascended, the bears saw crystal shapes carved in the frost. Drops of sun and with them snowflakes blended into a crystal bridge with archways crossed. The scene emerged now as a rainbow bended near a shining crown that was degossed, writ round this diadem of clay and coal within the darkest earth. The great light glows. Uh, we had a very long discussion about degossed as a word <laughs> and what we meant by that as a, as a symbol. The coal, you said the, the, there's a diadem of clay and coal within, within the darkest earth which is the coal that burns, there's diamond, right? The translucent rock that shines with the inner fire. So that last line, the darkest earth, coal and diamond, within our bodily, physical, fleshly selves is the light of the diamond, the light of our, our souls. Um, degaussing, um, we talked about as this process of resetting the soul through Holy Communion. And I'll leave my poet who figured that out to explain it, so this is what she said. Um, I think the world is a giant computer, and our sin gets recorded on the world like a cassette tape. <laughs> we, 
We literally F up the electromagnetic field when we sin. I think this is Christ, the degosser of history. Wipe the tapes, remember the sin no more. Everything is about the polarity, polar bear. You realize we, 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 we talk like this in these flashes, right? The polar bear, panda's a mixture of the poles or something, right, the black and white. But check this out, all ships pick up a polarity. They literally need to re be reset like a computer every time they dock or they get too much electromagnetic charge. What does that remind you of? And I said, I think it was me, Om um, Souls. And she's like, yes, how do we degauss? Holy communion. San Juan wiped his tape by eating the light. It's been pretty fun writing this poem, right? So, so that's what that poem is meant to be about. You can see the rainbow and the crown and the diamonds. Remember that the, at the opening poem, I said they were searching for a gemstone. Well, what was that gemstone? What were they actually searching for? Um, Another layer is that this is all about the temple veil, right? And this, this experience of seeing ourselves rendered in the story. Um, what was lovely having Hand Drawn Bear actually working with us on this, I mean, we felt like, see the pandas there, he's like peeking through. This is meant to be uh, the, the veil of the Holy of Holies, right? Um, but she was able to do things in her pictures that, you know, we, we can't completely do in the, in the text, but. It, and it's, it's a sort of, it's, it's a kind of interesting problem because on the one hand, you can, you'll know the story if you just look at all the pictures. She's an animator, so she, as she did the story with us, the pictures actually carry the whole story, but then the words give you something that the pictures don't and vice versa, right? And in my understanding, this is, it's a little like comic books, but it's also, uh, it's like prayer books, right? That you have a picture of the incarnate, incarnate world, the physical, the visible that you can see, and the words are the thing that also help lift you up to um, the mystery. Uh, we were always writing as a group, which was lovely, and um, this was very much, a, I think, a part of the lesson for us. That for me, co-writing, I'd not really done that before. Um, you know, using our own experiences and the story, doing the reference, you know, the reference materials, looking for, you know, the setting and, and, and so forth. Um, the whole poem is, in fact, something no one of us could have written, right? And that, I think, is, you know, in the sense of the sort of Pentecost and Holy Spirit, hopefully, helps. So how, did, how well did it work? Well, I asked my poets. Um, since writing Aurora Borealis and reading more Christian literature, not trash that happens to be Christian, I have found a deeper sense of profound devotion to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I also have developed a deep sense of loyalty to the Christian message of hope that those who wrote in the supposed dark ages were written with the joy of God. Um, that was Ryan Oakes. He's Mormon. And it was, it was interesting having Christians of different theologies arguing over some of our, 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 our details, right? So Ryan, Ryan was a great help to us in our writing. Um, this is what Hand Drawn Bear said. The temptation to backslide into writing dark tales was very real and took some purposeful undoing. It takes discipline to focus on the light. Um, Kimberly Crilly is a Catholic and um, had this to reflect on. I feel far less articulate than my poetry mates who've submitted their writing experiences, but then I guess that's what I learned from writing Christian poetry. Poetry, specifically the type of Christian allegory we wrote, allowed me to better articulate what I believed. Poetry is words which can project our brains, images, and feelings when we don't quite know how to explain something. Christians of all stripes wrote this poem together, but we were all able to communicate our Christian belief through poetry as if the meter were a translator. We all understood each other despite speaking different Christian languages. I like that, that the meter itself was translating for us, right? Um, here's the, 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 same, the same poet who gave us an explanation of de Gost, right? Um, Jacqueline Calfin, who's Coptic Orthodox. I've learned an enormous amount from her about the, the Coptic tradition. Quote, writing a poem with an entire group of people sounded like making soup with five different chefs. <laughs> the process was more like collaborating on music, and essentially it was. We all had to be in tune and hit the right notes to keep the thing together. I had to get a sense for the other writer's way of working and start crafting lines and stanzas that we could all build on coherently. The outcome was magnificent. This project tested my ability as a writer, having constant pressure of producing work for the group. More importantly, the way I wrote became more focused on telling the story that we had all entered in this group, 
So we were all there discovering it at the same time. In that sense, the story really became a part of the world as we tried to tell together what we were all seeing in the one story. Um, and then last, one of my younger um, poets, and therefore a bit of a troll, now I know what it's like to be a medieval monk who uses rhesus at bellum to grow in devotion to the queen of heaven. It feels nice to finally make a deposit into the treasury of merits rather than relying on St. Francis to do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Go watch Forge of Tolkien on unauthorized TV to, le unauthorized TV to learn more about the world building or more properly subcreating that we were inspired by. So actually I had some more pictures of showing you the route that we took to get to our, our, our story, right? Have I now convinced you to join me in the storytelling? Thank you. I think that's Oh, good. <laughs>